thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here, and it's certainly also a very great honor to be introduced by you, uh, the fresh, <laughs> fresh baked Nobel laureate. <laughs> And I'm also grateful that I can, that I'm allowed to speak here as a, as a physicist. That's not so <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> I talk about a, a new theme, which is tissue phenomics. It's, it's that new that it actually doesn't really exist yet, but it, it starts to exist. So I, I will talk about it, but I'm convinced it will, will uh, be born and will uh, come to life pretty soon. And the first indications for this already are around not just by us, but also by others. So and seeing, seeing the invisible is maybe the theme that's in common for what I've done in my earlier life and my life now, and it's also the theme that drives you, I think. And this, this was a matter I was uh, working on many years ago. You mentioned that, scanning tunneling microscope, and atomic force microscope, you can see atoms, and the basic idea is just touching the atoms and feel them with a fine needle. And then uh, you can see atomic structures, and they got uh, a few surprises here, because people had different pictures in their mind how that might look like, and it was much more disorder than expected. And then also later, Don Eichler and colleagues uh, discovered that you can manipulate uh, atoms with this uh, technology, shift them around, so you can touch them, see them, and manipulate them, and then it started, uh, people started to talk about nanotechnology because now you can build something bottom up. Very early already, I got, as a physicist, also interested in biology because I thought hmm, it would be nice to see all of the atoms or at least molecules uh, in, in biology, but it, it's much more difficult. And the scanning tunneling microscope works with the current, and the current is not so good uh, uh, for uh, biological samples. So then I invented this atomic force microscope, uh, which just uses forces uh, to, to, to see the atoms, and that actually worked. You get also atomic resolution there. And I started to work on DNA, um, trying to sequence DNA just by looking at DNA, reading the code uh, just with a microscope. It never worked. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have no clue why not, yeah? And, uh, and uh, because you, if you see the atoms, why can you see the, uh, read the code? No idea. And other people tried it as well. You can see DNA lying around, but you never resolve it on the molecular level. For, for some reason, but I still have that in the back of our, my mind that I have to do that once. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked also on living cells with the atomic force microscope, um, which is the difference to electron microscope where you just have to take a, 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 a cell and bring it into vacuum and it's dead. Yeah. So we infected the cells with uh, viruses and uh, worked on that, but we had to stop this work. Uh, because there was a problem uh, in IBM. IBM got into a crisis at that time and we had to stop work on biology, more work on technology. Yeah. That's the theme I will talk about uh, today. It's connected to pathology and these are the kind of images we have to, to look at and in, in principle it's a, back, a big step backwards for me from coming from resolving atoms now just completely normal uh, light microscopy, and even not using your fantastic uh, microscope. That's what's used in the clinical routine, and that's what we take, and try to uh, find some structures in there. And you can zoom in then, and come to something like that. And here it's the same, it's a, it's a question. Can we see something that is not visible if you just look at these images? And perhaps you can see something through big data. So big data approaches something appears to be important that you might not have noticed by just looking at those images. And uh, we, our focus is more or less today um, on cancer. And in, within cancer, we focus also a little bit on immuno-oncology. Um, 
And big data is, is, is a hot theme these days. It's in our daily life. It exists all, all over the place. And I personally believe that it could actually change our world dramatically. It impacts our world already today. I mean, people collect data. Digital data are produced like hell uh, these days, and they are uh, then processed, and you correlate it, and you find some regularities in those data. And if you do so, you learn something. You create a new knowledge. And the principle of big data is extremely simple. Uh, you just take all the data you get. If it's digitized, then you pack it somehow. <laughs> do it in a, put it in a, in a data mining tool. And in the data mining tool, everything is correlated with everything. And you find maybe some new outcome. And the new outcome is, in principle, new knowledge. So you might find out that if you correlate that, for instance, if women buy uh, sour cucumbers, they might be pregnant. That's a <laughs> new rule you found, and you created knowledge. Sometimes it's not so new. So this is a, the very basic idea. And and the, the, what many people think is that you can really put in everything you like, and the, the data mining tool will figure it out. They will correlate with everything, everything with everything, and they'll find out what is really relevant. Where do I have a really a strong correlation, and where, where I don't have a, a strong correlation? And this picture is not really true. It might be true for some data, where, the, where you already know that all these data points are really important. But there are other data points which are just rubbish. And, and you should avoid that. So only to a certain extent, this works. You have to do a little bit better. Um, you cannot use unstructured data. And images, is, I'll show you in a second, is one of those examples. You cannot put images into data mining tools. It couldn't make any sense out of that. <clears throat> so only in the framework that you have structured data and meaningful data, then the data mining tool can still uh, work with a lot of different inputs and figure out uh, something you had not thought about beforehand. And that's a, a statement of, of IBM that 80% of the data in the, in the clinic is unstructured. Uh, and they work on this uh, text understanding, automatic uh, text understanding to structure texts because there's a lot of text, just free text in, in, the, in the clinic. But the biggest part of the data is not in text. The biggest part is actually in images. And, and those are not really uh, uh, taken in a way that, that, that they are structured. And the reason for that, why, why that has not happened yet, is uh, images are difficult to structure and text as well. So if that's a, an abstract I've written uh, a few weeks ago. And let's structure this text yeah, in, in, in a meaningful way. And, and if you just do it in a formal way, like probably a machine would do it, you just recognize that there are a few words coming, appearing more often. And then you do maybe something very stupid. You structure your text this way. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's certainly not the way to write a, an abstract in the future. <laughs> Uh, I've taken the basic idea from, from a Swiss, actually. <laughs> uh, so you, you need a little bit more to structure the data in a meaningful way. You have to understand the data automatically in a certain way that you can structure those data. For the text, it means you connect the text to knowledge you have about text. Or you could say you have knowledge about the world, and you uh, then connect uh, a specific text to the, uh, to the knowledge about the world. And then you cross-link all your words in a, in a certain way. And this way you can understand the text automatically. And that's how the system from IBM is doing it. This is a system where it's called Watson, which might be applied also in the, in the clinic uh, in, the, in the near future. So in, in, in text, you at least have some structure already there. I mean, you have these letters. One letter does not have any meaning. But a word might have some meaning. It depends a little bit on the context of the word. 
but at least you have some meaning already to start with. For images, it's much more difficult. The only thing you have is pixels. Or if you have a 3D image, it's a voxel. That really has no meaning at all. Yeah, so you put all these pixels into a data mining tool, <laughs> nothing will happen. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> so what you have to do here as well, you have to connect all these pixels to knowledge, and then a machine should organize the pixels and group the pixels into meaningful objects till they uh, somehow look like what, how, uh, what we know about those objects. So how it's described in the knowledge base or in the class hierarchy. It's also a kind of an ontology, but it is a more concrete description how objects are. And here I'll give you an example. That's the, the, the basic objects you have in, 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 in tissue are cells, and in most images you have, you mainly see the nucleus, you see also the cells. It depends how you stain it. Uh, and it's a very basic object, but you see also some sub-objects in there structures in there which you also can figure out and, and quantify. And you have certainly much bigger structures, like then gland structures and, and, and so on, on tumor regions and stroma and all these different types of um, uh, regions you have in a, which you have to also then find and connect to the knowledge you have. Whoops, that was a little fast. So fortunately, um, we are today in a position where, uh, where we get these uh, images digitized. Yeah? So in principle, every year, something like 100 million of these huge uh, uh, tissue slices are investigated by pathologists. If you would digitize them all, you would have something like 100 petabyte. So that's really big data. Uh, today, only 2% of that is scanned, but already 2% is scanned, so that's already something, yeah? So you take these images, you bring it into the scanner, and you get a huge image of something like 100,000 by 200,000 pixels, so much more than what you have on your uh, camera, your digital camera, and then you have this uh, image, and yet then you can bring it into uh, image analysis, uh, analysis tool and uh, quantify and measure all these objects. But what you have also, you have different types of images. Um, you have the basic one, which is the H and East uh, stain, where you just see the morphology. You see mainly the nuclei, how they arrange, you can recognize the, the tumor, and it's in the clinic very, very essential. Every single diagnosis is made on the basis of such an image. Uh, if you, if you are, uh, might have cancer, you know, then, then it's diagnosed this way. And, and even more than that, then uh, which subtype do you have? It's also a question. And then people stain these different markers, looking for the different proteins which represent certain functions, and, uh, and in some cases also uh, looking at genes yeah, by the in situ hybridization. And you can take that together and come to a conclusion, yeah? taking all these different stains on the same type of uh, tissue, just a uh, very fine slice, just two, two to three micrometer thick, um, and, and you get all this information. Um, very, very elementary. So if you can make use of the information that is in those images, would be extremely helpful. I mean, it's done today, but if you can part of that, automize it and quantify more, then it might be even more interesting to do that. So and we, we developed then a technology which we call a cognition network te technology that automatically analyzes those uh, images and quantifies all the relevant objects that, that are found. <coughs> and these images vary quite a bit, so that it, it's not trivial to do that. Uh, in general, images like, like taking the images all that uh, uh, are in the internet, just to analyze them automatically is in principle un uh, not possible today. Yeah? So image analysis is really not, not so trivial and, and those images are also not trivial. So we developed a, a technique where we, where we can deal with complexity. And the basic idea is relatively simple. 
if you have a real complex situation, you cannot just apply an algorithm and solve the problem. That's not how it, how it would work. Uh, because it's so complex, yeah? That you can apply maybe a million uh, algorithms and try out which one might uh, take, part of, take part of the solutions, but it's, it, it, it's endless, yeah? It would last millions of years to, to analyze an image like that uh, in, in, in this way. So what you do in our approach, you just do it context-driven in a way that you first look for the simple objects you can find. There are always some in simple objects. If a nuclei, for instance, touch each other and maybe even overlap a little bit, that's difficult. But some of them might be isolated. And you first find those, and you learn something from those. Or you find these fine uh, nucleoli, these very high contrast uh, objects in a cancerous uh, nucleus. Then you can say, oh, if I found this one, it's easy, has high contrast, it has, you know, roughly the size of it then a nucleus might be around me. And you can look in the neighborhood and then complete this structure into a nucleus. So it's this context-driven approach where you start with simple, come to the next level of more complexity, and so on and so on. You do that in many, many cycles. Uh, that's more or less how evolution worked, yeah? how, how uh, life happened. It always was stepwise, doing one step, and then learning from that, and doing the next step. That, that's in principle uh, the technology, <coughs> sorry. And you, if you do want to really do a, a big data approach, you want to automatically analyze those images in a standardized way. Not that you uh, develop an algorithm, you analyze it, and next year you develop a better algorithm, and then you have to analyze everything again. So you want to have something of a good quality right from the beginning. And, and there we um, developed an algorithm where the algorithm ad ad adapts itself to a new image. Yeah, so. And it was the same principle. So you look at the simple objects, you learn something from that. And here, in this case, it's a, a machine learning applied. So you can look at any kind of images where you have nuclei. And it doesn't matter how they look like, the machine finds a round objects which are simple to find and trains on them automatically by itself and then looks uh, to the rest of the image and can analyze any kind of image you, you show, show uh, to the system. And this is what, uh, this random forest training, how it's done. And uh, I show you quickly a few examples how it looks like. So this is uh, one kind of stain, CD8. We learned that this is important. Um, that's an HE image, and so th there are different types of stains, and still the system finds roughly uh, this is a relatively good quality. I would say this is a quality that's good enough, uh, those structures. And then you certainly have to find the bigger structures as well. So once you have that, then the system can quantify all these uh, structures extremely fast and, and very precisely. So you have something in one of those slides, you have something like two million nuclei, for instance. Uh, and you have maybe different stains, so if you have 10 different stains, you have 20 million nuclei, which are all quantified by the machine. That's a lot of data just for one person, yeah? for one case. Oh, wrong direction. And the question is now, can you find patterns in those images which are relevant, which are interesting, and which correlate with something like clin clinical outcome or drug response. And the, the question is very simple, Be definitely, because it's done today. It's done by a pathologist. That's what they do in their daily work. Whenever a new patient comes into the clinic, that's what they do if, if he has cancer. But if you now quantify, like I ex explained, to such an extent, you might be able to do, do much more than what a pathologist can do. He would not have the time uh, to look at all the different um, objects and measure them. That, that would take uh, yeah, months, yeah? No, no way. So we, the machine can do it. And when, you, when the machine does it, 
it could correlate with many different things. It could correlate with clinical outcome, like disease-free survival time, but as I said, also a drug response, but it also could correlate with other things where you are a little bit faster, uh, uh, like lymph node extension or shrinking or a tumor itself or metastasis, size uh, depending on time, or some blood values like for prostate where you can look at the PSA value and, and, and look how it uh, develops. And then you correlate maybe those images with how, how, it, uh, how, the, how it behaves. Yeah. And you can test against uh, models also. Maybe take a mouse model and then have some assumptions and take then human tissue and find out whether you find more or less the same situation when you look at all the molecules and all the different types of cells. So we, we also introduced then a, a term which we call tissue fiend. The term fiend is, is known, is also used, but there is no term for tissue fiend. And I think it's an important term. It's just a, taking the phenotypes a pathologist already knows. If you quantify them, we call them a fiend. You usually have then a mathematical formulation also for this, uh, taking all this uh, quantification into account. And this then this uh, mathematical formulation describes the fiend. But what is even much more interesting, if you then discover completely new phenotypes nobody has thought about before, because you can play with all these modifications and, and try out many of uh, possibilities that might correlate, many features might correlate, and you, you figure it out. And if, and, and if something correlates indeed, you might have discovered something new, completely new. And this we call a novel fiend then, which in the end will be just a fiend after it's known and tested and well, uh, uh, verified. So the, 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 uh, the uh, terminology would be uh, tissue phenomics is just uh, the science of describing and discovering those tissue fiends. And a tissue fiend is a mathematically described uh, phenotype in, 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 in tissue slides. So if you, if you correlate, then usually what, what people also do, uh, you use a Kaplan-Meier curve, where you just plot the probability for disease for survival or, or something else yeah, over time. And usually the curves uh, unfortunately go down. And oh, all is wrong. <laughs> uh, and what, what the drug in industry wants, certainly wants is if they provide a drug and test, and that's here, for all patients, with and without treatment, but if you have a treatment, if you have a certain drug, but that's what you want. So if, if, if people are treated the right way, then the curve looks much better. And the people don't get any treatment, it looks different. You can do the same thing now with predictions. Yeah, now you find out in big data that something correlates with something else, and you can then uh, divide your patients into groups. For instance, you, for one group, you predict that they have a long uh, disease-free survival time, the other one's a shorter one. And then you would have a, a similar curve. And it really, it opens up and sp splits this way. Then you found something very interesting, and you found a new rule, so to speak. And we have done that already uh, quite uh, some years ago. Maybe we're not actually interested in that. We just did that for fun and, uh, and uh, had no uh, data mining tools at that time. And after doing that, we decided, no, we have to go into data mining. There's really something in there. So we predicted just by measuring the nuclei and shape, shapes of them and put them in data mining tool, we got a relatively good uh, prediction for disease-free survival time in, on her two stained slides and also just on the basic H&E slides. And we are not alone. There are some others doing that and some of them also now start to call it tissue phenomics. Um, so there's Jerome Gallon. Uh, uh, it was known that the immune system somehow interacts with the tumor and that uh, there's an immune response. That's, everyone knows that. But he could find out a very simple 
algorithm to predict uh, disease-free survival uh, just by using two, two markers and H and E. I come to that uh, a little later in detail, uh, which was a big surprise, and it seems to apply to all kinds of cancer types. Oh, uh, no, I should say. And Andy Beck, he worked on uh, breast cancer and figured out that the structure of the stroma uh, is very predictive or prognostic, has a high prognostic value. Just by measuring the shape of the, uh, uh, and, and forms of the stroma, it was a big surprise, it was known. I mean, that the cancer interacts also chemically with the stroma is known. But that you can really quantify that in forms of a structure, that, that was, was a surprise. And Peter Kay, work, uh, working on uh, uh, colon cancer, figured out that um, by correlating these buds of uh, tumor cells, tumor cells at the tumor fronts into cluster in buds, and people know that those buds have some prognostic value. But then he looked also at the much bigger buds, which actually are not really bugs, buds, because or they only appear as buds, because they, if you slice those tissue, you have only a two-dimensional image of them. And, and then a, a protrusion that, that is elongated and you cut it looks like a cluster. So those pathologists would not have called buds anymore. They are uh, too big for that, but he found those two big buds correlate more than the normal buds. So that's, again, a surprise. He just figured out by big, by big data approach, by just correlating many data with clinical outcome. So then you can do a much more sophisticated or much broader uh, approach by just starting very broad having less assumptions or hypotheses, very broad, and narrow it down by big data, big data approaches. That would be the way. And uh, you have to reduce also your data set a little, because, I mean, pixels are enormous uh, amount of pixels are in, the, in your images, but then you have also these millions of nuclei. That might be also too much. Not every uh, nucleus has a, has a really a great meaning. I mean, you do some statistics on, on those. You just do statistical measurement. What is the density of certain nuclei in a certain area? That's, that might be enough. There might be exceptions where a single cell really has a very important meaning, but in most cases, it's just the statistics. So that's an example for such a heat map where you plot the statistical uh, data, but it's in a very different area. <laughs> so that's what was uh, displayed on the internet during in, the, in this year during the World Championship. And you can actually ask yourself, if I plot such a heat map, where, you where it's just shown where all the players were located, looking at this heat map, which is just a statistical heat map, can I tell who won? <laughs> and more or less, that's what is, uh, tissue phenomics is about. So which features, but it's not so clear, which features, which structures are relevant. You have to figure that out. And you can figure it out through, through data <coughs> mining approaches, yeah? Who won is maybe here the same question. Here's an automatic image analysis on a tissue. And what you can see in red is a tumor. Blue is a stroma. Green is a healthy uh, glance. And yellow, very important. That's are uh, the T cells. That's a similar situation as before on the soccer field. Who wins? Can I predict <coughs> who wins here? And this is just done on the H and E image. If you do a little more, and that's what what Jérôme Gallon uh, did, he just added two markers, CD8 and CD45RO, two markers. And then he can predict who wins by looking at the kaplan meier curve. You can say in the matrix, if you have a high density of these uh, T cells of both uh, markers, 
in the tumor microenvironment, in this tumor margin, uh, invasive margin, then have a very good, good prognosis. And you can scale it down. It's, it's just in the inside and the outside. So it's, a, it's, it's just a matrix combining in the tumor and outside the tumor whether the, the density is high or not. I mean, this is, this is to me very surprising that you can predict who will win just with such extremely simple matrix. That's, for me, something seeing the invisible, because pathologists have, had, have looked at those images decades, and nobody has seen that, has discovered in those images that there is such a high prognostic value in just looking at the uh, to, uh, invasive margin and in, the, uh, in the tumor and looking at those two markers. These are well-known markers, so they are in use. But nobody has discovered that But just looking at those. So you use big data approaches, you use correlations, and here also some hypotheses, and you discover something, and you can see something, then later you can plot it actually in the heat map. Is the intensity high or is it low? You could, nobody has done that yet, but it's, it's obvious that one wants to do this to produce a heat map that can immediately tell you uh, is the prognosis good or bad. So we, we are planning to do that now in a very uh, constructive or, let's say, strategic way by starting with lots of different markers. And some of them, we might think they have value and others might have not value, but we don't know. We just t take a few more in and, and let the system figure out which ones are the, be uh, the best, uh, correlate best. <coughs> And then the question is certainly also from these heat maps, which, which regions to consider. And that's another example where you can plot a heat map and the density of certain uh, types of, 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 of uh, cells. And you can see immediately that the, this is all tumor, the whole structure is tumor, but it's by far not uh, homogeneous. Very heterogeneous, some markers uh, from the, the, the third from the right, I mean, it's just one hot spot. And the, also, the, the, but it's uh, just one tumor. So it's very heterogeneous. And then you have to ask yourself, which regions are then really important to look at, which have this predictive or prognostic value? That's, uh, that's not so clear. So the machine has to play with all these possibilities, shovel them around, and, and start with lots of different uh, stains, different uh, protein markers. We, we just use uh, here IHC markers. And, and then the machine runs and tries out many, many possibilities, and in the end spits out what are the relevant markers and what are the regions you should look at. So we, we, we are in preparation of doing that with colon cancer, with a partner in a partnership, and we have to, we start with 20 different uh, markers, uh, immune cell markers. Certainly a hot topic today, so we use them. No, no, no question. Epithelial cell markers that makes it simpler for the image analysis uh, uh, to, to, find, uh, to find the relevant regions. Then basal membrane markers to really identify, at least for some organs, uh, it's possible to identify then in an easy way the tumor. Uh, and, and all these other standard <coughs> markers which are, uh, where we all know that they have a value. We do the same thing also, we have already the the tissue now, and we have the clinical outcome data. Just we got them, so we don't have results yet. Um, for prostate, we do it differently. It depends on what kind of organ you are looking at. It's known that for prostate, morphology plays an important role, which is expressed in the Gleason score, that the folding of the, of the glands is a very important factor, and, and we incorporate that, but we will look at it with, uh, with a different view, not just uh, copying the uh, Gleason score, we just do it very differently. And we try out many, many possibilities and see in the end which one correlates. So that's then our, what we call tissue phenomics platform, where we do that automatically and just, I mean, the ideal case would be you have a press button solution, you just press and the system tries out all the possibilities and in the end you discover many fiends and you, they might be uh, uh, recycled for different types of indications for different organs. And you produce tests, which then can be implemented in the clinic, 
And once they are implemented in the clinic and you ask the patients whether those data can be used, you can feed it back into the database and it co the database is constantly growing this way and uh, you can improve your tests constantly also this way. So you have all these hypotheses which are also need to put in because uh, there are actually too many possibilities what you can try out to correlate. So you need some hypotheses and they come from pathology and they come from uh, systems biology as well. And something that was a foil that was mixed up. <laughs> Should have been in a different position. So we, we did just did uh, this Fien engine as I explained um, and tried to grab some information from the internet. So in the internet you can find just clinical outcome data coupled to images like that. Here in this case only H&E, you don't have the full blown uh, uh, story in terms of all the different markers. And then uh, Binder Schmidt is in our research group. He did exactly what I explained before, just uh, created lots of heat maps, combined those he heat maps and let the system try out all kinds of different segmentations of those structures that did some statistics and then he found certain objects. He had no clue what they are. Yeah, the machine does it just by, by itself. And then he had a test data set and he optimized uh, 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 this uh, finding of these uh, objects and it applied it, applied it in a blind way uh, to the second half of the data set and you get already a, a nice split. Also, this was a very primitive approach. So we are pretty sure that this approach will uh, bring us uh, lots of different surprises in the, in the near future. And, and then you discovered something. I, as I said before, you don't really understand what you discovered in the, in the right from the beginning. Yeah? You get some combination of features which have a predictive or prognostic value, but you don't really know why and, and what it means. So you, you, you have all these hypotheses which guide you, but then in the other direction, you found something that's interesting and you would like to understand it. And then additional work is triggered. Yeah, then, I mean, all these people in systems biology and pathology get some information that might, that might be useful for, the, uh, for, for them and then they, a new type of science might be or investigations might be uh, triggered. So what I, what I said before, an example, how could it be that looking at just the tumor microenvironment and the tumor itself and just using two markers that you can predict uh, the disease-free survival time? I mean, the immune system is so complex. I mean, for me as a physicist, I even don't try to understand it. Right? How could it be that such a complex complicated system can re be reduced to two parameters and a matrix of such a simple form to be com completely unclear. And uh, I mean here all the experts are in the room, yeah? <laughs> they might have an answer, I doubt it actually. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it's certainly an interesting question and so you find something uh, through big data and then you'd like to understand it. That's certainly one thing. Uh, that, that comes later, which is also important. And, and finally, I can say, I, I mean, if you combine all the information in a digital form and do the data mining, uh, combining with all other types of info, all the literature where you publish something about proteins or whatever, and pathways, and, and you add also the genetic data, combine all this into one huge data set, then it's certainly even much more powerful, but one should certainly not leave out tissue phenomics because a, r a large amount of very interesting, relevant information is captured in the tissue, that's for sure. And uh, so you have to take it into account. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>